The last video looked at a newly acquired ICO 667 tube tester that had just come out of the box and we looked it over and talked about uh, how clean it looked and pristine and we looked inside and had similar conclusions. In this video I want to go through and clean it up a little bit and change the electrolytic capacitors inside, test a few resistors and determine just what we have here. And hopefully we'll be able to turn this on and take it out for a test spin and test a couple tubes to see uh, how, how this unit performs. I'm hoping that we don't have loads of drifted resistors and that I can check a few and determine that they're not outrageously drifted uh, and after changing the capacitors turn it on before I really go through and find detail but we'll let the tester determine how fast we go so let's get started so this will look familiar from the last video what I want to do is start going through and looking more closely at the different components in this ICO 667 and uh, verifying the hypothesis that because this was a factory assembled model or likely a factory assembled model that it is in fact assembled correctly and uh, see if the resistors are still within tolerance. Let's uh, zoom in a bit here on this cluster of <clears throat> resistors. So these are 1% resistors. These correspond to, on the schematic, this ring of resistors right here. Okay, so this is R10, 11, 12, and 13. And uh, looking at this just a little bit more closely, the correct way to verify that these resistors haven't drifted and I suspect they're wire wound although on the list of parts it says carbon next to them but they don't look like carbon to me but the way to measure these is to desolder one end of each resistor so that the resistor is electrically isolated from other resistances in the circuit that is, if you look at this, a uh, fairly laborious thing to do. These are in here tightly and there's wires around and, uh, and that's going to be a little bit difficult. But there's a way to determine if at least the sum of these resistors are, uh, are accurate to see if they've drifted. And the way that we're going to do that is to realize, I promise this is the last time I'll show this, uh, is to realize that these resistors form a complete closed circuit as they are wired at present. So, one thing that we can do, uh, zoom out a little bit here, just so the jitters aren't quite so obvious, is look at this so we're going to redraw this okay so we've got what should be a 683 a 171 42 and a 10 ohm resistor plus or minus some change in in a circuit like this and what we can do then if we want to measure say across this resistor and this resistor with an ohmmeter or this one and this one or so on and so forth what we can do is we can just rewrite that circuit as the resistor that we're measuring across plus an equivalent resistance and that equivalent resistance is just simply the sum of the other resistors right and we can do that for each of the individual resistors in the circuit so I'm just going to do it for two I've worked out the math the equivalent resistance is just going to be the product over the sum where the sum uh, for where this resistor is just the sum of the other resistors in the circuit. 
So if we measure across the 683 ohm resistor, we should get a resistance measured around 169 ohms. All right. And uh, so let's, let's do that right now. Uh, this is the resistor that we're going to be measuring across. And we'll just see what we get there. Uh, so here's one end of the resistor. Here's another. So we were expecting 168.9, and what we're getting is 169.8. Outstanding. Uh, just then to look at the other resistor, if we want to measure across the 171 ohm resistor, then the math works out like this, and we should measure just right around 139 ohms. So we're now going to do that. That's the next resistor up in that line of resistors. And we get 139, 139.5 or 139.6. So the likelihood that resistors in that ring have drifted in such a way that errors cancel out in doing this, uh, you know, series and uh, scheme, series and parallel scheme, is very very low. So I'm pretty confident in saying that that these resistors have not changed in value, uh, and moreover, although we can can and will check the others, the that these resistors, uh, the resistors that look like this, in uh, in the tester have not drifted. We'll, we'll spot check that, but it seems like a pretty reasonable thing to assume. Okay, um, let's uh, zoom in just a little bit more here. Uh, one absolutely carbon-based or carbon composition resistor can be seen right there. And that is uh, so it's right here. So that's soldered in essentially underneath several wires there. And that, um, the color code on that is what? It's, it's red, yellow, orange. And that will translate uh, as uh, red is 2, yellow is 4, and orange is 10 to the 3. So that should be a 24 kilo ohm resistor. And the uh, the tolerance band on that is gold, so it should be plus or minus 5%. Uh, so 5% of 24K is what? It's a little over a K. It's 1.2K. So this should be uh, no higher than 25.2K when we measure it. Uh, and in the circuit, that is R4. 15, yes, that's R15, if you're playing along at home. So that's this resistor right, right there, okay, it's a one watt resistor. And let's see what that measures. Um, we can measure that one in circuit because one end of the resistor is tied to an open, a normally open switch. So again, let's uh, come over here, and let's just see what this measures. And I bet this has drifted a fair amount. Uh, and it's 26.2 ohms. So, um, you know, it should be 25 ohms and change at the most, and, and what we see is it's 26 ohms. Uh, that's probably close enough to uh, try this out uh, a little bit later, but I will change that resistor out eventually. I don't have, uh, I've got a 22K and a 27K ohm in my, <laughs> in my stock here, so I'll have to special order that one. All right. <clears throat> so what else do we have? Well, let's 
look over here. Here's another carbon composition resistor, right, right here. What is that resistor? Well, that resistor is what? Orange, black, yellow. So that will be 3,0, and yellow is 10 to the 4. So that'll be a 300K ohm resistor. And again, it's got a gold band on it, right, right there which works out to be plus or minus 5%. So 300K, 5%, 5% will be 15K. So that will be, uh, should be no higher than 315K. Um, and what is that in the circuit? So let's just find that in the circuit, in the schematic here. So I'm looking for a what? I'm looking for a 300K resistor, <clears throat> and it's hanging off a 100K potentiometer. So that, uh, let's see here. So this, uh, we can, we have clues here, right? So you see, let's just make it a little bit bigger. So the resistor, there's three uh, pins on this potentiometer, right? The, the, full, the full resistance and then the wiper. The wiper is tied to one end of the resistor, so that should help us zero in on this in the schematic. And then what? The other end is a wire that goes to a switch, and it looks like that's the line switch. Uh, all right. So, <laughs> um, it pays to pay attention to detail. So what I've just found here is I've located the resistor in the circuit. It's right here. Okay, zero in on it a bit. Make it larger. So we, what we have here, so we have a resistor. Here's the potentiometer. One end of the wiper is tied to the other end. This goes to the line switch that's absolutely this resistor. Notice that it reads 330K, not 300K. Um, and if it is truly a 5% resistor, there's no way that you could have just substituted in a 300K resistor. So uh, before we actually try to measure that. Let's, uh, I have a theory. Let's look at the other composition, carbon composition resistors, and see what we might find. Uh, so here's one in the circuit. Uh, this color code here is orange, orange, yellow. That's a 330K ohm resistor. It is attached to the negative lead of an electrolytic capacitor at one end. Uh, and at the other end, it is tied to a 100K potentiometer. Where could that be? Well, uh, I'll show you where that could be. In the circuit, so this was where the incorrect 300 ohm, 300K ohm resistor was. Up here is where we have the 330K banded resistor that connects to a diode, the negative lead of an electrolytic capacitor and a 100K pot. So when this was assembled, presumably in the factory, these two resistors were swapped. Um, this is actually consistent with a remark uh, that the seller made in the online auction where it was claimed that the tester worked but measured low, 
uh, on some known good tubes. I didn't think much of that uh, when I read it at the time because any tube tester probably won't agree with any other tube tester uh, of different make and model. Uh, and in fact, it might not even agree with another tester of the same make and model if they come from different eras or have been calibrated differently. But in this case, we have resistors that are actually out of spec for where they belong in the circuit. And they have to do with the line calibration and the leakage calibration of the circuit. So if those are off, it's entirely conceivable that it could throw a lot of other measures off down the line. So those will absolutely have to be switched. Uh, and as I look quickly, I have a 300 K ohm resistor in stock. I don't know if it's the right uh, power dissipation level, uh, but I don't have a 300 K resistor. So I'll have to order that. Um, okay, so, so there we are. There aren't very many carbon composition resistors in this tester that I see. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on, get it in focus. Uh, there is behind, well, so under this electrolytic, uh, can we see it here? Uh, there is a carbon composition resistor, uh, which is blue, gray, blue, gray something. I'm partially colorblind, so resistors are really hard for me. So we'll have to figure out what which resistor that is in the circuit. But it um, it's in parallel with this what, 10 microfarad capacitor, so it shouldn't be difficult to find. And, um, and in fact, that's uh, resistor R2, so that should be 680 ohms. So let's just quickly look at that and see what it measures. And it measures, uh, uh, measures uh, 700 ohms. The, um, it's a silver band. So that's 10%, so 680 plus, uh, so that's, that's clearly within tolerance. That's good. And then behind this, it's a little difficult to see. Uh, all right, let me, let me move it around a bit here uh, so that you can see it. All right, so here's the capacitor we were just talking about. So here is, this is a modern resistor. That, that resistor has uh, almost certainly been swapped out for a new carbon film one. It's, uh, it's not a three band resistor, it's got more bands. And I think that's a more modern marking. Let's just see if we can quickly locate that in the circuit. So that is, uh, that is attached to a 50 ohm precision resistor. And that would be, uh, let's just see if I can locate that very quickly in the um, circuit. And so there's, okay, so that, so that must be R5, which is listed as a 129 ohm resistor. It looks like it is attached at one end to a normally open switch. So let's just see. And in fact, we get 128.8 ohms. So there you go. All right. What I will do now, and I'll do this off camera is I will check the two 10 microfarad capacitors, electrolytic capacitors. Uh, one, this one actually, is uh, a 25 volt capacitor. The other one uh, is a 150 volt capacitor. If they don't leak, I will simply leave them in the circuit. So far, aside from the, the resistor swap, I think this looks pretty good. All right, I checked the capacitors on the underbelly of the tube tester, and neither of them showed leakage. I suspect that these have been replaced since the 
uh, unit was originally manufactured uh, and possibly at the same time as the one resistor that we pointed out that was a modern carbon film resistor uh, was inserted. I suspect that, that all, all of the components were changed then. In any event, the only two components that I found in here, as we discussed earlier, that need changing are the two resistors that were uh, 330k ohms and 300k ohms that had been switched. So that was R19 and R6 uh, in the schematic. I measured those and they've drifted out of tolerance, out of the tolerance bands marked on the resistors. Uh, so I decided not to swap them into the right places but to just wait until I get the right value of resistor and then put them, uh, install them in the correct locations and at that point do a calibration on the unit. The calibration instructions uh, are included in the owner's manual. They appear to be very straightforward and essentially entails uh, adjusting the line cow pot which is the pot that's in series with the 330K resistor uh, and the leakage cow pot, which is the pot that is in series with the 300K resistor. So it's not at all surprising that incorrect values of those two resistors that were swapped when they were installed could result in a miscalibration or uh, a consistent set of readings that are off from what they should be. These are not precision instruments as we've discussed in previous videos and is very widely discussed online. These are essentially go no-go units. They're not laboratory grade instruments. Uh, that said, the comment that the seller made is entirely consistent with the incorrect values and drifted values of the two resistors that we found. Okay, so I'm not going to calibrate the unit uh, or make an attempt to calibrate the unit at this time, but I've determined that uh, with the capacitors okay and um, everything else looking fine, that I'm going to plug this in and try to measure a tube. Okay, so. Uh, earlier, and I didn't show this on camera, I cleaned up the power cord a bit and made sure that um, there was no oxidation on the blades of the power cord, and uh, that, that worked out well. Okay, so there's the unit plugged in. And I'm just going to read along on the operating instructions in the manual for how to test a tube. And I've got a, uh, I just grabbed a random tube. I've got a 12AT6 tube here. Okay, 12AT6 that we will test. And in other tube testers that I've tested this in, this tube has tested fine, uh, above marginal, uh, and that would be Gee, with a uh, Hickox 600A and a uh, a uh, Sencor uh, Mighty Might, I, I'm blanking on the model number at the moment. The, this tube tested fine, so we'll see how it fares in the uh, ICO. So step one: insert the power plug into an outlet. I've done that. Turn the tester on by rotating the line adjustment control clockwise from AC off. Okay, so that will be over here. So I'm going to turn this on. Okay, off, on. Doesn't make a, a large clicking sound by any means. And I don't know if you can see it, but up here there is a pilot light, a red light that comes on. So that's very nice. Make sure the Transistor test setting is set to tube, and it is. Make a preliminary line adjustment. Okay. So that is done by holding the line button down while turning the control, the line adjustment control. So 
uh, the line button, the line, uh, the line control here is, um, just take me a minute to locate it. Oh, here, uh, the big red button that says line, of course. Okay, so we're going to do that and we're going to line this up with the, here, let's zoom in a bit. Okay, so we're going to uh, adjust the line pot until we're lined up right in the middle there on the line adjust, so that's pretty good. Okay. That was step four. Step five, press the reset button to release any of these that happen to be, um, happen to be depressed. Okay, and so that's the reset button there, All right? Uh, that was line <clears throat> five. And again, it says make sure that the transistor test is set to tube. And there it is on tube. Move all 15 levers to the one position. So these are all at the one position. Step seven, find the tube type you wish to test on the tube charts. Okay. So I've got the tube chart here. And we're going to go down to the that I say? I said 12 AT6. Yes? Yeah. So that's right here. Okay. Um, just a, a point here on the 12 AT6 and the 12 AT7. So on the 12 AT7, you see it, it uh, says uh, set the filament to 12.6 volts uh, and then for the grid, right, this is a dual tube, uh, so for the grid it says 78 for one setting and 70 for another. Um, on the 12AU7 it says 20 for both, uh, both sections. For the 12AT6, one is 67 and the other is 13 uh, volts. So those are really disparate and, and I don't understand why they're so different. But I did look up on other charts and they seem not to change. So I don't think this is an error. Okay, but um, anyway, here are all the settings that we need to set to test both sections of this 12 AT6. Okay, so proceeding now, I'm just going to set all those. So 12.6 volts, that's going to be, let me zoom out a bit. So 12.6 up here on the filament is there. So there's 12.6 volts. Set the grid to 67. So there's 67. And you can, you can tell immediately that this is not a precision instrument with the coarseness of the, uh, the feel on, on this potentiometer and then just you know, the, the amount of parallax that is possible with the very small lines and the very coarse uh, line on the knob. This is not meant to be a highly reproducible reading. Okay, but anyway, here's 67. We want 36 for the plate. So we're going to go over here to 36. Let me just step over to the other side and make sure that's reasonably close to 36 and it is. All right, setting the levers now. Uh, it, they should be in one, one, two, one, and then five, five, one. Okay, so one, one, two, one, five, five, one. And then the next section are all one the V should be in position two, and S should be in position six. Okay, so there we go. Um, that was step eight, and step nine, and step 10, and then step 11, which is check to make sure all the settings uh, don't have mistakes in them, which we, which we did. Right. Step 12, uh, insert the tube into the base. Okay, so here we go. So there's the tube in the base. It cautions you not to make mistakes here. 
Step 13, allow sufficient warm-up time before proceeding. Uh, and then it gives guidance on that. Essentially, let it warm up for, for a minute and, and you'll be safe. So we'll just let that warm up a bit and we'll feel it to make sure that something is going on in there. The current is flowing and and I do feel I do feel it warming up. So that's a good sign. And I don't see any blue smoke emerging from the vents in in the board. So that's all very promising. Yes, it's absolutely getting warm now. All right. So uh, step 14 now is to go back. Now that you've plugged the tube in and the filament is drawing current, that will likely bring down the line voltage. So we need to recalibrate that. So we're going to push the line again. And yeah, maybe it's changed just a bit. So we'll just make a very small adjustment there. All right, that was step 14. And then step 15 is to check for leakage. So this is the essentially the Schwartz test, Schwartz and leakage. And for that, we go back to the um, to the information. So we have got our 12 AT6, and we're testing this up here, right? So this is the 1121551, 2 and 6. So for leak, we're going to push buttons 5 and 6. Okay. Um, you see that there are some of these numbers for other tubes that have, in fact, for the second section of this tube that we'll be testing, that have um, an underbar that, that are underlined. And the underline means that when you push that button up here, you also have to push the HK leak button in order to get a correct measurement. But for the first section of this tube, we don't have any underlines. So that's just button 5, which we will press now, and button 6, which we will press. And you see that the meter essentially doesn't move. Why don't we just zoom in a little bit more for that. So let's do that again. So watch the meter, button 5, nothing, and button 6, nothing. <clears throat> the importance of that is, I'll just lift this up so we can see it a little bit better. Just zoom in a little bit more here. So you see that we're reading this scale down here, the leakage scale, and this is calibrated in ohms. So because this didn't move uh, very much, if at all, away from the infinity mark, we see that this has essentially um, no leaks. It is not at all even remotely shorted. Uh, it's better than 20 mega ohms resistance. So that's exactly what we would like to see. And it's interesting here in the manual uh, it's where they say standard for acceptance or rejection on inter-element leakage, um, excluding cathode heater leakage, no less than five megs on any test. Um, it's a pet peeve of mine. It's, it's, the term is mega ohm. There should be a unit associated with that, but um, I'm being a little pedantical there. Anyway, no less than 5 megs on any test. A stricter standard for higher reliability applications would be no less than 10 megs on any test. And here, we're, because the meter didn't move, this is showing greater than 20 mega ohm resistance. So we passed that test. The next test now, that was step 15, uh, is to go on to the merit test. And the merit test is, is not leakage, it's a combination of other dimensions of tube quality, and I don't really want to get into that now. Uh, we'll probably get into that in the final video that, that I've alluded to earlier. 
Or you could go look at Alan Douglas's book where he discusses the uh, dynamic conductance method more clearly. But here we're just going to mechanistically go and make, make the measurement. So for the 12AT6, to, um, we did the leakage test. Now for the merit test, we are again going to push button 5 and then we're going to pull the merit lever down. And you see that we are in fact in the kind of a questionable area. So not good, not replace. Uh, maybe at the bottom edge of good or the upper end of questionable. So now we're going to look at going to depress the 6 button. We're going to do this again. We see this measure is solidly in the good range. All right. We should not throw this tube away for many reasons. First of all, it uh, tested fine on other tube testers. Second of all, even if this were calibrated and we had confidence in all of the components inside, which we don't right now. But even if we did, um, just because this was in the questionable range for one of the readings doesn't mean absolutely and finally that this tube is not going to function in circuit. This is something that is kind of unsatisfying in a sense. Uh, tube testers, unlike other instruments that we tend to have on our benches, are, are not necessarily accurate or precise instruments. And a lot of them measure the tube in, in very different ways. So that's why I say I think of these things as go, no go indicators more than anything. Now we're going to go and we're going to test the other section of this 12AT6 tube. So we're going to keep the filament on 12.6. Now we're going to change uh, first of all, we're going to hit res the reset button there. Now we're going to change the grid uh, voltage from uh, 67 to 13. So here we're going to go down to uh, two marks under 15. So that's 13. And we're going to increase the plate from 36 to 93. Okay. Again, just step over here and make sure that we're reasonably close to 93 and we are uh, and now we're going to change these levers and uh, we're going to change them so that uh, maybe maybe so we can see them a bit better so now they should not read 112 but they should read 512 so 5 1 2 and then 1664 so uh, five, one, two, one, six, six, four. Okay. And you see that I made a mistake, so it's really good to check. So this should be, no, I didn't. Here we go. So five, um, five, one, two, one, five, sorry, <laughs> six, six, four. Five one two one six six four. Okay. After a while, all of these numbers start to jump out at you, and it's really easy to get confused. So you you need to check these things over and over again. And these levers, V should be one, and this should be four. Okay. And in fact, it's probably good to always start from the bottom. So one, two, three, four. All right. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to depress button one. Okay, and why don't we just kind of move up a little bit here. So again, we can see the buttons and the meter a little bit better. So button one, it doesn't move. Now button two, there's an underline under it, so we're going to press that. And you see that it goes all the way up and you think, wow, I've got a short, but remember we have to push, push the HK leak button to take the reading and we see we get you know, essentially nothing. Um, no deflection on the meter, which means it's greater than 20 mega ohm resistance. Okay. And then now we have to press button 7. And there, again, we get no deflection on the meter, so greater than 20 mega ohms resistance. 
And now for the merit, with the button seven depressed, we're going to press the, uh, going to pull the merit lever down. And you see now that we're in the low end of the questionable range in the upper end of replace. And as I said before, I, I don't believe that uh, because this tube has tested uh, acceptably, uh, even moderately well on, on other testers. Will I believe it after I change out the resistors and calibrate it? If it still reads that, then that will be additional information for me to think that if I use this tube in a circuit and it doesn't behave the way that I think it should, then maybe I should use another tube. But I don't want to belabor the point. Clearly, the uh, this tube tester is working in ways that uh, make sense. I'm not finding shorts or leaks in a tube that I believe is good. The same tube appears to test well, or at least acceptably well, uh, for different sections. You know, I don't hear any hums that I don't expect. The meter doesn't waver back and forth when it deflects. Uh, this appears to be working essentially correctly. I think I will wind the video up at this point and return to it when I get replacement resistors in. And for the next video on this instrument, which will probably be the last video, we will uh, put those resistors in and calibrate the unit and then come back and retest this same GE branded 12AT6 tube and see if the readings improve. Okay, I have to say I have really, really had a lot of fun working on this tester today and making this video and understanding bits and pieces of the circuit. It doesn't hurt that the unit is shiny uh, and clean and uh, you know, there are people that become essentially addicted to collecting tube testers and vacuum tube voltmeters. And I understand that. Uh, <laughs> this is just a beautiful machine, whether it's accurate and precise or not. But anyway, as I said, I'll stop there. I hope you found this interesting. If so, uh, please leave comments below and uh, leave a thumbs up. As always, thanks for watching.